Welcome everyone to the Word on Fire show. I'm your host, Joseph Glore, and with me in the Santa Barbara studios is Bishop Robert Barron. Bishop, good to be with you. Hey Joe, always good to be with you. We had a good night last night. I came in uh, yesterday and we were able to go see with Father Steve. We saw The Darkest Hour finally. Yeah, the Churchill movie, which I wanted to see all during the season, and it's finally playing a little local theater here in Santa Barbara. And it was good. The great Gary Oldman plays the Churchill, and I've, I've loved Gary Oldman, you know, for years since he played uh, Dracula, you know, back 20 years ago. Didn't see that but, one. Oh, it's great. In fact, he, with the old age makeup on, you know, in Churchill, yeah. he reminded me a bit of his Dracula I could role. see him. I could see yeah. him as a vampire. Oh, he yeah. was really good. But Churchill was, um, it was a good movie. Kind of thoughtful. Not like a, you know, a super energetic movie, but sort mm-hmm. of a thoughtful movie. It was a movie about speech to me. It was a, there's yeah. a lot of talking yeah. and the power of speech. I think Churchill's famous for his speeches, but right. for me, that's what that was the point that came across. Yeah, I think that's right. And Lord Halifax's famous line, which they have in the movie of, you know, at the, this moment when Britain had nothing else, he mobilized the English language and used it as a weapon. You know, he used the language itself to rouse the people. So that's true, I think. Well, Churchill was a pivotal player in the history of the 20th century. Absolutely. And for anyone who follows Word on Fire, you know that our big film project is Catholicism, The Pivotal Players. That's the one we're working on now. We finished volume one, which tells the stories of six pivotal players in the Catholic Church that also influenced all of Western civilization. Now we're working on the next six pivotal players. Can you rattle them off quickly? Oh, I hate when when I I ask that because I always forget somebody, but we did... uh, Augustine and Benedict last uh, summer. Yep. This coming summer, we'll do um, Fulton Sheen and Flannery O'Connor. And then finally, we'll get around to uh, Ignatius of Loyola and Bartolome de las Casas. Yep. So those are the remaining six. Uh, as people probably have, have uh, sensed, it's slowed down since I became a bishop. It's much harder for me now to find that requisite time to get away. They require a good amount of time when we go to film these things. So they're a little, they're coming, but they're coming a bit more slowly. What I thought we would do with this episode and maybe the next few episodes that I host is give people a little taste of the pivotal players in a new way. We're going to celebrate some of the lesser known figures in the Catholic tradition because it is hard trying to narrow down 2,000 years of extraordinary saints and pivotal players down to just 12 people. So I thought maybe we could take this opportunity and talk about different Catholic heroes that maybe highlight the tradition in different ways. So today's topic is great spiritual athletes in the Mm. Catholic tradition. First off, what is a spiritual athlete? How would you define that term? That's a uh, it's an old term. In fact, at Mundelein Seminary, where I spent you know many many years, there's a there's a famous uh, sculpture and it shows Saint George with the dragon. And at the bottom of the statue, it says, Atleta Christi Nobilis, That's the noble visited. athlete of Christ. You know? yeah. So that idea of the one who strives, the one who uh, struggles, who's involved in some kind of contest, whether interior or exterior, in service of Christ, so not just for the sake of, as Paul says, you know, leaves that fade, like your, your, your crown of laurels, but... Um, you're doing battle for spiritual purposes. So that's an old idea and uh, stretches all the way back, of course, to the Bible itself. Think of almost every major figure in the Bible has to go through a desert time. Yeah. They've got to go through a time of preparation. Um, this is in that great you know, myth of the hero, which can be found in almost any culture. Uh, the, usually a young man, could be a young woman too, but who has to leave the sort of uh, safe domesticity of home and be trained for battle. And it involves, depending on what part of the world you're in, the desert or the jungle or the tundra or someplace where you're sent out to make it on your own. You just got to go and survive. And you call upon strength you didn't know you had. You realize enemies you didn't know were there. And in that hero's journey, you're now ready to assume a position of, of real leadership and usefulness to your community. Otherwise, you're, you're stuck at home. And, you know, the thing of like a little child stuck at home, they're just worried about themselves. Yeah. They're not going to help the community. They're, they're just, you know, gimme, gimme, gimme. So a lot of that is to get over that childish self-preoccupation. My life is not about protecting myself. It's about becoming a warrior, you know, or, or to soften the image a little bit, becoming an athlete, someone who's able to enter the arena. You know, I just like that term. Uh, can you get in here? Can you get in and, and, and fight the good fight? Uh, do you have what it takes? Have you submitted yourself to a spiritual master, to a discipline? Um, 
a nicey nice spirituality is not going to do this for us. And we might feel good about ourselves, but at the end of the day, who cares? It's, the spiritual life's not about feeling good about yourself. It's about becoming an instrument in the hands of Christ, you know? Um, so can you be shaped under his tutelage for service? Uh, so that's what spiritual athleticism is all about. I'm reminded of that Johnny Cash line, being a Christian ain't for sissies. Yeah, I know, quite right. And But that's, you know, that's true of any serious spiritual person knows that. Spirituality is the highest level of... Um, of demand, so the contest is is most intense at the spiritual level. I mean, so you know about it with your own athletic background and and uh, bodybuilding and all that. That's what's involved. I mean, you gotta you gotta pay the price, right? If you want growth, yeah. And and are you ready for this? Are you willing to to do what it takes? So all of that. See, I think that harder edge side of the spiritual life was missing when I was coming of age. Yeah. We, and people, I get it, they were reacting to a hyper stress on the other side. Right. And so we got a very kind of softer, nicey nice approach to spirituality, which again has certain virtues, thank God. I mean, we, we certainly heard the message that God loves us, and that's great. That's a right. very important message. But I think the harder edge thing, which you need for spiritual heroism, we didn't hear as readily. Well, let's start off with our first great spiritual athlete, and that would begin with no other than Anthony of the Desert, probably the most notorious for being spiritually rigorous. <laughs> yeah, Anthony is a, is a fascinating figure. We just, as we record these words, we had his feast day just a couple of days ago. Yeah. Um, Anthony, who was born middle of the third century, lives, uh, if the accounts are correct, he lived to be over 100, which was pretty <laughs> rare in those days. Um we hear that beautiful account in Athanasius's life of Anthony of the call. He's a young man, like eighteen or so. His parents have died, and he's you know wrestling with his vocation and all this. And he hears at mass. It's beautiful because he hears the same the same words that we hear about. If you want to be my follower, go sell all you have, give to the poor, and come follow me. Mm-hmm. So Anthony said, "Okay, I'll do it." And so he he sells almost everything, keeps you know enough though for his sister. He has a younger sister. Then he goes back the next day and hears an even more dire, you know, word from the gospel about, you know, if you if you set your hand to the plow and keep looking back, you're not worthy of the kingdom and all this. So that inspires him, okay, I better get rid of absolutely everything. And off he goes into the Egyptian desert. Um, and this sets the tone for all of Western, really, I mean, all of monasticism, both East and West. Um, he's the father of monks. Of that whole tradition now stretching up through, um, you know, Basil and and um, uh, Benedict and Augustine and everybody else. The father of that is is Anthony. I will go out into the desert to do a kind of spiritual warfare. You know, now we can visit all the stories about Anthony, but um, becoming a soldier for Christ, an athlete for Christ, uh, a radical self gift, a willingness to live in in dramatic simplicity and poverty and self-denial. All that really kind of begins with his witness. And I, one thing I love is, is the great Athanasius himself, who was, talk about a, a fighter, Athanasius, who was the bishop of Alexandria during the Arian crisis. And, you know, we say now, of course, Athanasius won, but man, it wasn't clear in his own time. He was exiled three times from his own see, yeah. kicked out, wanders the Christian world. But he eventually writes the life of Anthony, which then lights a fire in Europe. So by the, um, in the, into the fourth century now, in the fifth century, the greatest figures, think of Chrysostom, think of Jerome, think of Augustine himself, they all want to take to the hills and, and become radical ascetics. It's because Athanasius, who knew Anthony personally, wrote his life and lit this fire of, of um, passion, you know. Now fast forward to someone like Benedict, this young man, studying in Rome, gets disillusioned with the kind of, you know, raucous life of his fellow students, and heads off to Subiaco, east of Rome, and lives for three years in a cave by himself. Mm. But during that time of gestation, he becomes a spiritual athlete, who then, it's no exaggeration to say, saved Western civilization, because the Benedictine movement preserved almost all of the classical culture that we have, rebuilt Europe, uh, physically, literally, and certainly spiritually. So anyway, I, Anthony is a hugely influential figure. 
talking to some of my Protestant friends, they argue against, they know how much of a fan of monks I am because I think all that is so cool, you know, and just so tough. And they, one of my friends argued with me that he thinks it's okay to do for a time, but that no one would be called to be gone their entire lives and not in service of people directly. Where, you know, Benedict and Augustine, they contributed in a massive way, but Anthony the Desert kind of just lived out in the middle of nowhere his whole life, right? Right. Here's the thing. Always, as I'm making a sweeping generalization, always avoid. But whatever we say, it's never this way. It can never. There's something right in your friend's intuition. I think in a lot of the spiritual people, they, they do go through a very intense period. Think of like a, a soldier going through boot camp, you know? Mm-hmm. Yeah. We don't live in boot camp yeah. uh, the rest of your life, but you go through it. It's like an intense apprenticeship. Um, like when Jesus sends the disciples out, you know, he's, you know go without, you know, um, food and without a, a, um, a suitcase and right. just, just go, you know? And Paul, when he was, before he went into evangelization, he took some time to just... Yeah. Yeah. Like you said, a gestation period. Right. But, and so was Jesus saying to his disciples, live that way all the time? Or was he saying, no, I want you to live this way intensely for a period? Or think of Ignatius of Loyola in the cave at Manresa. So he spends a year, doesn't cut his hair, doesn't cut his fingernails, lives in rags, fasts, you know, the, the intense, intense spiritual uh, uh, preparation. But he didn't live that way the rest of his life. He then came out of that and then entered into his, his ministry. So there is something right about that, that maybe we're called all at a time to do it. However, I think there are people who are indeed called as a whole life to live that way. Look at the monks of Mount Athos, if you want, stretching back now centuries and centuries. Monks who've lived in a radical asceticism. Or a a young Thomas Merton who decides, I'm going to be a Trappist monk. And man, when he became a Trappist monk, it was serious business. It was sleeping on on boards and it was fasting most of the year. Um, You know, so I, I think some people are called to it. See, mind you, a monk is never just doing this for himself. Like you know, I'm, I'm going to. The monk is is in deep solidarity with the whole mystical body of Christ. Mm-hmm. The monk's life is a life of prayer on behalf of the church. You know, um, and so it, it's not like it's a, it's a self absorbed yeah. move. I, I had heard a story about a Baptist preacher who went with some of his students and talked to Merton in his hermitage, and they said, oh, "It's just terrible. A guy so bright like you is just wasting his life." out here in the middle of nowhere. And Merton, surprisingly, didn't take any you know, offense to that. You know, <laughs> Typical of him, he yeah. was so loving. He just said to back to them, I believe in prayer, it's my vocation. Yeah. And he said, you know, and then the guy was immediately humbled to think that what more important thing could Thomas Merton be doing than yeah. praying for the rest of us? Yeah, right. And, and even see precedent, because there is petitionary prayer indeed, like I'm going to pray for someone else. But in the very act of of living your life in intense communion with God, that's affecting something. <laughs> because if you're connected to God, you're connected to everybody else, willy-nilly. And that's Merton's um, Fourth and Walnut Street experience, you know, the famous, uh, can't anyone tell them they're all shining like the sun? Well, that's born of a, of a deeply contemplative entry into God, which means I'm connected to everybody else. So it's never a withdrawal for the sake of withdrawal. It's a withdrawal from the dysfunction of, of the world to find the right way of being and seeing. Yeah, while we're on Merton here, just as a little aside, because he's definitely a spiritual athlete in his own right, one of the things you've always talked about in Lent is Merton's approach to the worldly pleasures of being like children, yeah, right? And right. I think this is helpful for people to understand, well, why would you pour ashes on your food and just make yeah. yourself miserable for God, like God <laughs> yeah. just needs that from you? No, and that's to read in a kind of puritanical way, which is the wrong way to read it. And, and what you're saying is right. The great spiritual masters have always realized that the immediate physical needs, so think of food, drink, and sex, are the, are the three great pressing needs, because they're the life needs. Mm. Those are the life drives, right? Mm -hmm. We have to eat, we have to drink, and then the species needs sex to survive. And so those drives are so powerful in us. Are they good? Yes. So we're not not Manichaeans, we're not Platonists or or, uh, Puritans. But can those drives, precisely because they're so powerful, overwhelm deeper desires of the heart, prevent deeper hungers and, and questions and desires from arising? Mm. And the answer to that is yes. Absolutely. So you say, like, that's Merton's image of, of the little kids. If a parent simply indulges his kids every time they wanted something, 
Mommy, give me now, now, now. I want it now, now, now. Or like, you know, your dog, like Jolene, who wants something and she's bark and bark and bark and yeah. bark. Well, if we just indulge that all the time, well, then they'll be running the house before you know it. For sure. So Merton says like the your desires for food and drink and sex, if you just simply indulge them, you never discipline them, they'll be running the house. Now welcome to a lot of dysfunctional lives. Mm -hmm. When you start uh, examining, like, you know, what, why is this person so unhappy? Well, they've allowed these... these uh, and I call them lower. I don't mean they're bad, but we allow the lower desires so to dominate mm -hmm. that now a, a dysfunction occurs within the soul. Yeah. So that's the purpose of asceticism, is to discipline that business so that it doesn't uh, dominate. Like I'm thinking in your world of, of bodybuilding. So we all got the, you know, you put a, a bag of potato chips in front of me. Well, yeah, I've got this desire. I eat the whole yeah. bag. Pizza's never a bad idea. Exactly. I put a <laughs> pizza in front of me, man. I'll eat the whole pizza. Right, yeah. But... You know, the result of that is a d deep disequilibrium in the body. Right. And so if, if I allow those desires to dominate, then I'm going to be unhealthy. Yeah. Exactly the same thing is true in the spiritual order. Uh, and so the church recommends these disciplines. Uh, and then the, the radical ascetics are doing it in a, you, know, you might say, exaggerated way. Again, not unlike someone in your situation vis-a-vis -vis the physical, you know. Um, you did it in a very intense way, very radical way. Yeah, with bodybuilding, yeah. Yeah, and so... Fitness. Is everyone called to that? I don't think so. But, you know, you were. Yeah. I think and everyone's called to take care of themselves. To be healthy. Oh, right. Yeah. So, and the same in the tr spiritual tradition. Right. right. And so you got an Anthony, for example, who's a real, you know, spiritual bodybuilder. Yeah. Olympic level. Yeah. Right. Well, now let's move on to our second great spiritual athlete, and that would be moving us into the medieval era of St. John of the Cross. I love St. John of the Cross. My home parish in Western Springs, Illinois, was St. John of the Cross Parish. So I, I knew about him since I was a kid. I didn't realize till I was reading Merton in the, when I was a teenager what an important figure John of the Cross uh, is. He's in the mystical order what Thomas Aquinas is in the intellectual order. He's the greatest of the, of the mystical doctors of the church. Um, I love about John of the Cross, 16th century figure. It was, it was a real um, renaissance of spiritual life. Think of Ignatius that time, Teresa of Avila that time in Spain. Um, John's involved in the reform of the Carmelites to make the Carmelite order more faithful to its original uh, inspiration. The discalced Carmelite, so-called, simply means those without shoes, right? So living in a, in a very radical, uh, simple way. Uh, John <laughs> faced the deep opposition of his own brothers, uh, calling to mind Dorothy Day's line that we suffer much more from the church than, than <laughs> you know, on account of the church. Like, like we, the church itself can often be the source of <laughs> greatest struggle. Right. Because John of the Cross was essentially kidnapped by his by Carmelite brothers, and he was imprisoned and brought out uh, once a day only for the sake of being beaten. So they would they would put him in the in the uh, refectory. And the monks came and eat, they would they would beat him. Now people complain about a, a bad homily or some sort of liturgical <laughs> yeah. issue that they right. are in agreement with. Right. But then John, during this whole time, he only lived to be about 49, he didn't have a long life, wrote some of the most splendid uh, poetry in Spanish language and I think arguably the very best uh, mystical theology. So an account of what it's like to move into deep union with God. And, you know, one of John of the Cross's famous uh, uh, lines is, you know, nada, 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 nothing, nothing, nothing. And people say, oh, gosh, what a, what a downer this guy is. But see, it's the same principle. What he's saying is you have to say no to all these lesser desires if you're going to allow the desire for God to arise. So what do I want? Well, I want nothing of that. I want nothing mm -hmm. of this. I want nothing of that. So that the all of God can fill you up. See, John of the Cross knew we have this infinite hunger for God. He knew what Augustine knew, that we're wired for God. And, and he wanted it all. Mm -hmm. He wanted it all. But he saw the danger is we just keep throwing all these finite goods into the infinite cavern of our hunger for God. Yeah. And what that does is it leads to deep frustration. And so the move is nada, nada, nada. You know, um, Because we hate these things? No. Because he's puritanical? No. Because he wants the soul to be oriented to the one reality which can uh, satisfy it. And I think that's where his spiritual athleticism uh, comes through. 
Of course, his great text, Dark Night of the Soul, is one of my favorite spiritual texts. And I tell all my friends, if they, if they know someone or new Christians that I meet, read that book almost straight away as soon as you become a Christian. Because, boy, I tell you, the beginning chapters of that book it just cut me to the heart. It was so convicting because he talks a lot about the spiritual moves you make when you be first become a Christian, a lot of the errors that you make and taking the wrong spiritual paths. Well, and the thing is, you know, we it's become almost a uh, a cliche in, in people's uh, parlance to speak about the dark night as though it's like depression. Mm. Well, that's not at all what he means, of course. Mm-hmm. The dark night of the senses first and the dark night of the spirit. Dark night of the senses would be this quieting of the senses. There's the Merton thing. Quiet, of course, Merton loved John of the Cross. Um, quiet the senses lest they dominate your whole soul. Once they're quieted, now these deeper things can arise. But you also got to quiet your spirit, because your mind, think of the Buddhist thing of the monkey mind, but the Christian uh, tradition knows about that too. The mind keeps generating all kinds of distractions and all sorts of preoccupations. Well, you got to calm that too. That's the dark night of the spirit, is a detachment from all the preoccupations of the mind. Then that beautiful thing is now my house being all stilled, John says, right? Mm, Beautiful. The house of my soul being all stilled, now I can go out lit only by the fire in my heart. Well, see, that's the the heart that desires God. And wow, now that all this other stuff has been darkened, so to speak, that light can really shine and can really guide me. That's the idea. Um, When the lesser lights are always going, the senses and the mind and my ambitions and my fears and all this, well, then I, I'm not the, the hunger of the heart won't be felt. But bring those other lights down. Now the real light can shine, and now your life gets ordered. And see, once that happens, then the lesser lights find their place. Great, great. Bring them all back in if you want, sure. but now they're in the right order. you know. But often you've got to go through, and here it is a negative thing. You've got to go through a detachment from these other preoccupations. And here's the thing I love, too, in John, is if you don't do it, God will do it. So <laughs> if you've started this process and you've said, all right, Lord, I, I really want friendship with you, and God says, okay, fine. And I might even give you in the beginning a lot of what they call consolations. You right. Know, that in yep. your spiritual life, you it feels Honeymoon. great, yeah. things are going well, and, and every time I pray, it just feels like I'm in heaven. and you know, Great. But, see... That's also something you got to let go of, because God wants you to love him, not the consolations. Mm-hmm. He wants you to love his will, not the jollies you're getting from doing his will, if I can put it that Absolutely, way. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, that's a hard business, because um, God will do it if you don't do it. He'll, he'll draw you through the dark night of the senses and the spirit, which is why, see, when you're reading uh, life, your own life or someone else's, Oh my gosh, I'm going through this terrible time. I'm so depressed or I'm angry or I'm this I'm a failure. This didn't yeah. work out. Well, yeah, you can read that uh, psychologically, you can read it interpersonally, you can read it professionally. But see, how do you read it spiritually? Mm-hmm. What's going on? What are you being forced to let go of possibly? What was too dominant a concern in your life and is God stripping that away from you so as to allow a deeper hunger to emerge, you know, all that stuff. What's God up to? That's always the question. And what he's up to is union. He wants yeah. friendship. Even, even when he feels like, even when it feels like his presence is not there. That... Yeah. God can take away the feeling of God. And that sounds like a paradox, but it's, it's dead right the more you think about it. Because God doesn't want you falling in love with the feeling of his presence. He wants you to fall in love with him. Mm-hmm. And those can be two very different things. Um, and the great spiritual athletes learn to discern that difference, you know, and it can require a lot of time in the desert. Think and now, if you want, Mother Teresa of Calcutta, who heard the voice of Jesus as a young woman calling her to this particular vocation, and then for fifty years until the day she died, mm. never felt it again. Right, right. Now you say, "Oh, the poor thing; she's so depressed." All no, no, no. The, the, that's that's dark night of the soul stuff. It's it's being stripped. Away. It's having the the sense of God stripped away. It does not mean God is stripped away. If you're just tuning in, we're talking to Bishop Robert Barron here on the Word on Fire show about three great spiritual athletes. We just heard about Anthony of the Desert, 
then moved up to the Middle Ages with St. John of the Cross, and now we are going to move into a more modern era with Pier Giorgio Frassati. Let's talk about Frassati and how is he a spiritual athlete? Yeah, he's one of my favorite of these contemporary saints. Frassati uh, didn't live a long life, born 1901, dies 1925, so he's all of 24 when he dies. Frassati was the son of the editor of uh, one of the biggest papers in Italy. Uh, his parents were kind of, you know, Catholic, but more secularist. You know, they certainly wouldn't have raised him in a strong Catholic uh, manner. But yet he emerges as a very young man, um, captivated by the Mass and the Blessed Sacrament, and given to um, works of charity and love for the poor. And those two things play out alongside of a very active and vigorous um, social life and athletic life. So he's a young guy who loved to climb mountains, loved to hike, loved sports, loved games. Uh, most photos of Frasati, and we have quite a few, show him uh, laughing, smiling, uh, horsing around with his friends, climbing a mountain. Yeah, you know? that pipe. Yeah, the, the pipe, of the, the kind of mountain, jaunty yeah. pipe in his mouth. Yeah, yeah. So all of that you know, kind of joie de vivre stuff, but coupled with mysteriously, I say it, because he, he wouldn't have gotten it naturally from his parents, mysteriously a deep love for the Eucharist and uh, for the poor. And it's his love for the poor that, that brought about his early death, because there was a very virulent form of polio that was in a particular um, neighborhood in Turin, where he's from. And he was ministering to the people there, and he got this form of polio. I think of, of Cardinal George, just a couple decades later, uh, you know, contracted polio, not as virulent as Frasati's. Frasati died within days. He's a vibrant, active young guy, and then in, in about three days, he was dead. Um, but then the lovely story is parents had no idea about his connections. But at his funeral, the whole, tens of thousands of people, especially among the poor, showed up for his funeral because they knew him as their friend, you know. So I just think of Frasati as an athlete kind of in the typical sense, the term. Yeah. You know, a mountain climber and all that stuff. And then also all that time in adoration. Right. And he would uh, he'd be gone all night, right? And his parents, he's a teenager, and he's gone all night. And the parents said, what is going on? And, and they asked the parish priest, could you find out? What's he doing all night? Where's he going? Who's he with? <laughs> High school kid, not typical response. Right. Yet. And so the priest comes and says, well, I hate to tell you, He's spending the whole night in Eucharistic adoration. That's where he is. So his parents, again, were sort of flummoxed, like, how, where'd this kid come from? Uh, but that's why John Paul II made him the great patron of World Youth Day. So he's a model for young people, full of all the vitality of youth, but also deeply connected to um, the spiritual reality. But I think of that, that all-night vigil-keeping as a type of deep spiritual asceticism. Uh, do you get... A thrill from it? Yeah, sometimes. You know, I think of, um, I try to do a holy hour every day, and uh, there are times, that, and I do, I savor that time. But, you know, other times, uh, you know, you're maybe not in the mood, or mm -hmm. you're not feeling that well, or you're tired, right, or something. just want to get on with your day. Yeah, and so it's not the jollies you get from it that matter, it's the connection and the friendship that matters. I think Frasati understood that in his bones. Next up, it's time for our listener question. Remember, if you have a question for Bishop Barron, you can go to askbishopbarron.com and submit your question on any device, and perhaps you'll be featured on one of our upcoming episodes. Today's question comes from Michael, and he wants to know, how can you have a discussion with someone you disagree with while remaining charitable? Let's listen to what Michael has to ask. Hello, Bishop Barron. My name is Michael from Indiana. I enjoyed the discussion you had with Dr. William Lane Craig. In one part of the discussion, you asked him to raise some objections he had about Catholicism, and he did. My blood began to boil a little bit when he mentioned those objections, but I was impressed with the level of charity you had towards him. So my question is, how do you maintain charity with someone you passionately disagree with? Thank you. Yeah, good. Thank you for that question. And, and you referenced this dialogue with William Lane Craig I had just last week. Um, great Protestant uh, philosopher and uh, apologist. 
And um, I asked him that question point blank. I said, you know, what, what intrigues you or beguiles you the most about Catholicism, and then what do you like least about Catholicism? And, and he rehearsed, as the questioner was suggesting, a lot of the, the classic 16th century debates, you know, about Mary and about the Pope and about justification. And, and these are things, yeah, that I would have a strong disagreement on. Uh, first part of the answer would be, um, Michael, that it, it wasn't set up as a debate. So part of that was just kind of a strategic thing, that this was meant to be more of a conversation. But your, your question is getting at something deeper, which is how do you handle this? I, I think, first of all, always to realize that the person matters more than the ideas. So there's a person with you. There's a, someone who's, who's loved by God, who is invited into full you know, union with the Lord, and that's what matters first of all. If I'm so on my high horse all the time, and I'm 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 right as rain about my Catholic faith, but I'm I'm off putting, I'm belligerent, I'm overbearing, I can be right, but I've lost a soul, and that's all that matters. At the end of the day, you know. So it's the person comes first, and so charity must always be in the mix. Now, to your point, it doesn't mean that we duck the questions. I don't like that. I don't like an ecumenism, for example, that just ducks the questions. No, no, I, you, you, you address the question. It doesn't mean that you kind of, you know, uh, walk gently around the question and just address it in a very indirect way. No, no, I think you can address it with full intellectual engagement, um, even polemically so, meaning that, you know, if there's strong disagreement, let it be heard. But at the end of the day, it's love that matters. The great model here, G.K. Chesterton, in his relation to his intellectual enemies, like George Bernard Shaw. And G.K. Chesterton, who vociferously, strenuously disagreed with Shaw. But yet, at the end of the day, after the debate, he and Shaw would go out and they they would party together. They'd have a wonderful time drinking beer together and... And they never lost their friendship, which I I always find that very edifying. They never lost their friendship. So that's how you do it. I think love comes first. Connection and and, uh, uh, the soul in front of you comes first. But it doesn't mean that you duck or that you soften your engagement of the question. Thank you, Bishop Barron. And thank you all so much for tuning in to the Word on Fire show. If you want to learn more about our epic film series, it's a global adventure that tells the biographical tales of some of the greatest players in the Catholic tradition. Go to PivotalPlayers.com where you can watch the trailer and learn more about that. And also, please do go to iTunes and leave us a review for the Word on Fire show. The more reviews we get, the more people get to hear this great word from Bishop Barron. Thanks again, and we'll see you back here next week for the Word on Fire show. Word on Fire.